quote several studies going back actually to David Sutton's work in California in the 1960s, which he showed that 95% of all cases were solved by the plea bargain, not by a jury trial. Of course, we, we grew up with Perry Mason and um, old Stanley Gardner. We, we grew up with, uh, what's her name? That doesn't matter. All this. <laughs> CSI, crime scene uh, investigation, law and order. And there you see a lot of this is going on, quote, in the courtroom. Uh, but in fact, most of this is plea bargaining. Here's the CSI effect with a particular kind of twist that's fascinating. Prinsek and Kitzberger are studying what's happening inside of uh, the UK system. And what they're reporting is that the accused actually have come to believe, have a more sense of the legitimacy of DNA uh, testing and fitting and matching than does the prosecution. They ask the prosecution, they say, well, there's certain kinds of problems. But the accused are overwhelmed by the CSI effect. They've been watching television, too. So in this study, they say what you might expect, that when the prosecuting attorney tells the defendant or the defense attorney, they've got the DNA. They've got the matches at nine loci. They've got the matches at 12 loci. The defendants are likely to plea bargain very quickly and say, well, it's all over. Now put that in the US context. But then the context of what Harry Levine talked about this morning. Extraordinary expansion of this database to arrestees. Most of these young black or Latino people. And now you've got DNA coming in with this effect. Prosecutors are entitled to, or what they're entitled to or not, they do it. Um, they lie, they cajole, they indicate things which are not true. And one of the things is, is now, I think a, a big issue is the CSI effect with respect to saying, we have your DNA. Now, unless defense attorneys know more about this Arizona database problem I just described to you, 122 matches at nine loci <laughs> among 65,500 people, that's not exactly your definitive science that says, got you. But now, let's back up. Let's say, it, there's a match in the Arizona database. The first one hits. The prosecuting attorney says, we've got your DNA. There's a fit at nine loci. It's all over. 121 other people could have been also matched and told that they were guilty, told that the, the DNA was definitive. So that's the social context in which I've described what I call this metaphoric shift in DNA dragnets. I'm mindful of the time, and so I don't want to go into too much detail here. Um, but I do think I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the Daryl Hunt case, because it has to do with, this is the poster child for familial searching. So Hunt is exonerated after spending 18 years in prison, North Carolina, serving time for rape and murder. Um, convicted offender data bank had about 40,000 at the time. So they had an unsolved crime. And they found no perfect matches in this cold hit. But they found a sufficient number of, of connections, you know, little connections of probably 7, 8, 10, not sure, I mean, 16. They found 16 out of 26 matchings. Now, therefore, it couldn't have been a particular person that they were looking at but they said somebody in his family, probably, with 16 matches, they figured must be a sibling. So they then search around, and they find that um, his brother, Willard, is a suspect. They follow Willard Brown around, get his cigarette butt, pick it up, and find a perfect fit at 13 loci. All 26 fit, um, and he's spending time in prison for the murder. Now, when you talk to the police about this kind of case, they say, oh, you see, 
if we could just do familial searching, you've solved a rape. How can you be opposed? The rhetorical force of that is overwhelming. This kind of case comes up, and like I was saying this morning about uh, <laughs> Duena's work, um, you know, if you get a case like the, the Todd Lee case, you have this one case, it's sensational, got the murderer, and how could you be opposed? Well, you've got a familial searching situation, but now, um, put this in the context of expanding DNA database with lots of Latinos and blacks and familial searching. And what you've got is a sometimes three, five-fold expansion of a six million database. Familial searching winds up being a de facto expansion to the families of those who are in the system. Now to the literal dragnet. I'll just spend five minutes on this and then have a chance for an exchange. This is the literal dragnet. The British pioneered it. Um, 4,500 people around a rape scene were told, give us your DNA. And 4,500 said yes. Um, if you don't give your DNA to the police, you're a prime suspect. Something else, therefore, going on with a dragnet, which I think Shelley sort of mentioned, alluded to, but you didn't catch, catch the flavor. Because if, if there's been a murder or a rape in the area, and I ask you for your DNA, and you refuse, you're a prime suspect. So now I can follow you around, get your cigarette butt or hair follicle from the barbershop or from your, your Coke bottle. So a man asked for a sample from a friend. His friend said, not me, turned him in, DNA match. Big st big st this was a big story back in 89. It was the first big hit, the first big uh, dragnet with this kind of a hit. It was called The Blooding, Bantam Books, 20 years ago. The largest ever DNA dragnet is um, in Germany. 16,000 samples, similar situation, a rape murder case. German police requested to obtain 16,000 tissue samples. They asked every male between 12 and 55 in the area, five mile radius, give us your DNA. If you say, Yes, they've got your DNA. If you say no, prime suspect. Put this into the context of American uh, racialized dragnets, and I'll close here. When in America we have a dragnet, we tend to think in terms of, well, is the person black or white or Asian or, you know, that's the first question. And because of the way in which we set up our system, um, we're looking primarily here around issues of race. And so indeed, the San Diego dragnet was the first one which was clearly racialized, looking for an African-American serial killer, they thought, and they got 750. Turns out, just a short time later, Ann Arbor, Michigan, another serial rape murder case, so, thought to be an African-American, uh, and so they got onto the campus of the University of Michigan. A um, Little bit of turmoil there, and there was a bit of a reaction. I'm going to cut this short. The same thing happened in Charlottesville. It's happened in several places around the country. Um, I put it in the paper just to give you a flavor that this kind of thing is likely to continue. Uh, what I want to, uh, I guess, conclude with <coughs> are these kinds of concerns, which I'm sure, again, Bill will address in his remarks later in the afternoon. But just to give you a sense of this huge social political fabric in which we're living, in which the CSI effect is so powerful that wherever I'm spending time, I was in Austria back about eight months ago in, in Vienna uh, talking about these issues and uh, an audience of around 250 people, I would say two thirds had seen CSI and knew what it was. I was in Singapore at, back in the spring, an audience of over 500 and about three quarters knew what CSI was. This is a worldwide phenomenon. The, the CSI effect is not just happening in the US, it's happening around the world. And so this notion that somehow got the DNA, 
got the fit, it's all over, is the next stage of what's happening here. You put that in the context of Harry Levine's work about arrestees by race coming into this system, and you're seeing what, again, I'll call the surge, the inevitable creeping of this phenomenon. Um, put that alongside of these kinds of developments. What's happened, uh, again, with um, Peter Neufeld going to Mississippi. You, you, you'll hear, read about this probably in tomorrow's paper, but this is the tip of an iceberg. The Mississippi case is like the Houston case, like the Virginia case, um, like many others where there have been close scrutiny. And what you see is patterns of lab work where there is problematic technology, people spending time in prison, some of them being executed for DNA work that's been very sloppy. So rather than looking at this through the lens of the CSI effect, that they've got the material, they've got the data, we should simply submit. I think the time has come for close scrutiny and real basic questions about the whole infrastructure of this technology. Thank you.